Greetings lovely humans and welcome. So, I had an idea earlier this year for a Halloween project. I love The Nightmare Before Christmas and had the idea of doing some kind of historical Jack Skellington. Then I watched a few clips here and there of Gentleman Jack and my brain just went, Gentleman Jack? Jack Skellington? Gentleman Jack Skellington? And it was at that point that I knew that I absolutely had to make a gender-bending 1830s Jack Skellington, because of course I do. It'd be cool. That's the only justification I need, okay? I then realised to be able to do this project I would need to learn significantly more about late Georgian and early Victorian men's tailoring, which to be honest wouldn't be particularly difficult because previous to starting any research I knew absolutely nothing about 1830s men's tailoring and it is very easy to know more when you're starting from absolutely now. So I started with some basic googling, just to get a rough timeline of the fashion into my head, so I at least had reference points of what areas I needed to look into further, and then as I learned more I dug deeper into specific subjects that I needed to glean more information about. So the general lay of the land that I got from my research is that the breeches and hose that had been pretty standard in the early Regency period, towards the end of the Regency period, slowly started to give way to the popularity of full-length trousers. Now, trousers were generally cut quite narrow, with like a little strap at the bottom to nestle into the instep of the foot to keep the lines of the trousers really crisp and straight, which I think is adorable, honestly. Stirrup trousers have been around for much longer than the 1980s would have us believe. But there was also the Cossack style, which had much wider legs that narrowed at the ankle, and the fabric at the top would be pleated into a waistband. That's the style that I am going to focus on because, well, honestly, they'll just suit me and my body better. And interestingly, or to me anyway, trouser clothes had started to change. Previously, trousers had a full front, one of those flap things with the buttons on either side, but by the 1830s the modern fly front closure became pretty standard on full length trousers. On breeches they still had a full front, but full length trousers. Flies were the thing. The more outlandish dandyism of the early 19th century had like mellowed out a little bit by the 1830s, although not disappeared entirely. So it was quite common for fashionable men, in order to add some extra panache to their outfit, to wear very brightly coloured and heavily embellished waistcoats under their darker and more subdued outer layers. In fact, waistcoats were quite often the fanciest and most expensive part of a man's outfit, and fashionable wealthy men often had multiple very fancy expensive waistcoats, so dandyism definitely wasn't dead. Men at the time wore tailcoats, frock coats, and in some contexts Spencer jackets, but tailcoats were still standard for evening wear. Although frock coats became more common as day wear, they didn't really reach their height of popularity until like the 1850s-ish. The highly exaggerated fashionable shape for men's bodies at the beginning of the 1830s that consisted of a very small waist and very puffed broad shoulders and chest that was generally achieved through corsetry and padding also became a bit more toned down with the movement into the Victorian era, but again didn't disappear entirely, which is handy for me and my hourglassy shape makes it much more manageable for me to tackle making menswear from this era than it would be for me to attempt to make like more modern menswear. Now, a couple of points that are relevant to interpreting Jack Skellington specifically through a late Regency, early Victorian lens. Top hats were most definitely a thing. In fact, it was pretty standard for men to wear top hats literally everywhere, and thankfully by the 1830s it was popular for them to be made of silk and not beaver pelt, because I'm not, I'm not doing that. Another important thing is that the bow tie, as we think of it, didn't actually exist until like the 1880s. Men did wear neck pieces. They would either generally wear a stock, which was a stiffened collar that fastened at the back and would be covered either in silk satin or velvet, or they would wear a cravat. So I can't make Jack Skellington's iconic bat bow tie, but I can make a bat cravat. I, I can make a cravat. No clue how I'm gonna do it, but the option's open to me. 
So I'm now at a point in my research where I know what items I need to make. For me to realise this costume in its entirety, I need to make Cossack style trousers, a shirt waist, a bat cravat, or cravat if you will, a waistcoat, a tailcoat, and a top hat. So, you know, just one or two items to occupy my time this October. But I know what I need to make. I now just need to figure out how to make them. Thankfully, the V&A website had an absolutely incredible tailoring reading list, including secondary and primary resources on tailoring through different time periods, so I will link in the description to that list in case you're curious because I found it incredibly useful for seeking out primary sources on men's tailoring in the period I'm looking at. Some of which, by the way, have absolutely incredible titles. For example, you ready? The Tailor's Friendly Instructor being an easy guide for finding the principal and leading points essential to the art of fitting the human shape, forming a complete system, delineating the different parts according to the proportions of the human figure, illustrated with 20, 4, 24 engraved models of different garments designed on the principles of practical geometry, containing the reason of every rule, also remarks on numerous systems in practice by different authors. The second edition, corrected, enlarged, and improved by J. Wyatt. And my favourite thing about that one is I've had a quick peek over it. It's about 144 pages long, and about 40 of those pages are just pictures. It has that title, that length of title, and like, it's only about 100 pages long. Very much on board with that. In my research it was also very clear that the materials of the time, for at least the tailcoat, would have been wool, and other items would have been made of silks and fine cottons and linens. And I would really like the chance to do this outfit right. The trouble is, good quality suiting wool in large scale pinstripes is very expensive. So I'm gonna have a coffee link down in my description if you are pumped about this costume idea and you would like to see it come to life, or if you've just watched my videos and enjoyed them and would like to help me make more things that you're likely to enjoy, I would really appreciate it if you chucked a dollar, four dollars, ten dollars, whatever is affordable for you and reasonable in your eyes, into helping me bring this into the world. I obviously have a buttload more research to do in terms of the minutiae of how exactly these garments would have been made at the time and doing my best to chaotically approximate them in the way that I do, but I hope you enjoyed getting a little bit of a peek into my research and design process. If you're new here and you would like to keep hanging out, that would be very cool, but whether you decide to keep hanging out or not, I hope everything is okay in your world, and I will see you guys next time, and in October for this project. Halloween is my fave, if you hadn't guessed. Bye guys! Let's find the thing. There's the thing. Fabric. Ugh. What's the word? What's the word, brain? You know the word. It's one of your favourite words. Embellished. Embellishment is one of my favourite words. Blah.